living creatures. And so we're going to be in Ezekiel 2 and 3 um, this evening studying Ezekiel's call and commission. Before we uh, dive into that, I've asked Matt if he would lead us in a word of prayer. Almighty Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and place that we could step out of the world, that we could join together as one to worship you and to study your word. We're thankful for the family here and all those that have gathered tonight. Help us to clear our minds and distractions, uh, be with Adam as he brings us the lesson, and help us all to glorify you and to learn more about your ways and your will for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, a point that Brian made to me after, uh, some, sometime after the class on Sunday that I thought was really good is uh, perhaps one of the reasons that we have that vision in Ezekiel 1 of, of God on his throne and these four living creatures and everything is you think about the fact that Ezekiel was in captivity and the, the people of Judah, they're there in Babylonian captivity and who's king over them right now? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. And back home in Judah, who's king on the throne? It's a puppet king, Zedekiah, that Nebuchadnezzar has placed in power there. Yet, God is still king. God is still king. And he's on his chariot throne, which can go anywhere. Perhaps a point of, one point that can be derived from that is even way over as far as Babylon. God is, he's king everywhere. And I just thought... Uh, what a powerful idea that was. But all of that that we studied on Sunday from Ezekiel 1 is to prepare us for 2 and 3, chapters 2 and 3. Because that whole vision was just setting the scene for God calling Ezekiel as a prophet. I want you to think, I just want you to put yourself in that position. And, and I'm not going to go through that whole vision, but you've just seen this mighty vision it would have been so inspiring. It would have been so encouraging. It would have been such a reminder of the absolute power um, and kingship of, of Yahweh. And following right on the heels of that, uh, Ezekiel has fallen on his face in the last verse of chapter 1. And then we, we have the, the beginning of his call. Let me mention this first before we start into chapter 2. This is going to be the takeaway. It's kind of long. But I had a little bit of fun with this. God is pleased when his word is preached, whether received or never believed. I'll say that again. God is pleased when his word is preached, whether received or never believed. So, of course, the point of that is what God expects of us is we, we need to spread the gospel. And when we've done that, that's all we can do. God is pleased, no matter how people respond to it. That point is just made over and over in these two chapters. It's a point we've heard a lot, but it's, it's important, and we need to be reminded of, of these important things. So let's just read the first seven verses here as we begin. Then he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. So he had fallen on his face, as I mentioned. So he tells him, stand up. Verse 2, as he spoke to me, uh, Ezekiel says, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. Then he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel, to a rebellious people who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. I am sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children. And you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, As for them, whether they listen or not, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, neither fear them nor fear their words, though thistles and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions. Does that sound pleasant? <laughs> neither fear their words nor be dismayed at their presence, for they are a rebellious house. But you shall speak my words to them, whether they listen or not, for they are rebellious. There's so much here. First thing I want to point out is the term that God calls Ezekiel three times. He refers to him as, as what? Son of, man. son of man. Now, that term, son of man, uh, basically just means human being, which think of you know, the contrast. Ezekiel's just seen this great vision of God Almighty, and he's humbled, and then God says, human being, stand up that I may speak with you. You see the contrast in, in this context? So powerful. It's the first time God calls him that, but he's going to call him that all through the book. Son of man, 
son of man, son of man. Who else used that term? Obviously, Jesus did. The term is found 191 times in the Bible. 93 of those are in the book of Ezekiel. Like, that term is in Ezekiel a lot, more than in any other book in the Bible. And that term, Son of Man, is found 80 times in the Gospels. So, most of the time that that term is used, it's either referring to Ezekiel or Jesus. Interesting. What's a possible connection here? Why would Ezekiel... I mean, why would Jesus call himself after the same term that was known to be the term Ezekiel was called by? What thoughts do you have on that? Any guess? Mr. Jack? They both were preaching to the people who would not receive their word. That's where I was going to go with it. I mean, that's a clear connection, and we're going to see that more as we go through here. Jesus' ministry was similar to Ezekiel's in the sense that they were sent to a rebellious people that were absolutely rejecting the Word, but that didn't mean the Word was going to stop being preached. So we, we see that, that similarity. That's a good point. That's exactly where I was going to go with that. Another thing to notice in this, in this passage, in verses 3 and 4, you have the sons of Israel, the children of Israel, called by three different terms, three different adjectives in verses 3 and 4. What, what's the first one in verse 3? What are they called? A white people. <laughs> Rebellious. A rebellious people. Then in verse 4, what are they called? Stubborn and obstinate. Three synonyms there, rebellious, stubborn, and obstinate. You think God was trying to make a point here? I mean, these people were really, really, really stubborn. God had to say it in three different ways. In fact, of all the generations of the Israelites that we've studied, this appears to be the most stubborn. Uh, Think about it. They're in captivity. They're being punished, and yet they still don't see the light. They, they still don't understand the truth. They are still rebellious uh, in that state when they should, you know, be soft-hearted. Uh, now, twice in this passage, God says to him, I want you to speak my word whether they listen or not. So again, it's just driving home that point. The, the responsibility of Ezekiel was just to proclaim the word. He couldn't make the people respond. God gives free will for people to respond. And so it kind of brings me back to the main point that I'm wanting to drive home in this class in my fun, fun little uh, memorable saying, God is pleased when His Word is preached, whether received or never believed. Now, let me ask a question here. And Jason, I'll take, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't see your hand until I was already, my brain was on this question. So I'll get to your comment in a minute. What experiences have any of you had dealing with individuals who refused to listen to God's Word? Any of y'all had any experiences like that? Jason? Uh, my ex fiance this is one of the reasons that we, she is an ex fiance and she had trouble uh, accepting the truth of Scripture because it said some things about her parents' spiritual state that she did not want to believe. Okay. And so, a lot of times, we're not dealing with objections to the Word of God itself. Yeah. For what it says, we're dealing with an emotional response. Yeah, absolutely. That they don't want to, I just don't want to believe that. If they accept the truth, it's like they're condemning their parents. Which yeah. I tried to explain her. Yeah. We don't have to do that. We can share the truth with your parents. They're still here. Yeah. All right, good. Any other? I'll take maybe one or two more quick comments. Matt? Uh, it's similar to someone who did have faith, but then it was like, well, I see what you're saying. That's good for you. That works for you. I mean, this works for me. Okay. So those are hard when yeah. they do believe in God. Yeah. But And you're trying to say, well, you know, you need to adjust some things. Sure. Like, oh, that's great. Good for you. Good for and you. I got this, and you got that, and that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Back home, um, every time we go in a park to employers and invite people to do Bible study or have a Bible study with them right then, um, usually some of them will, like, spit us or even to the point of being verbally aggressive or, like, wanting to beat us up or something, like, get out of here type of thing. Because they see you with a Bible or... Yes, yeah, because it wasn't something that we could provide them, like, financially. It was a different kind of, you know, they were looking for something different than just spiritual food. So, wow. 
some of them just did not want to hear about God just because they were so mad about their own situation. Yeah, so yeah. that made them even more. Yeah, that's an experience I've never had. Somebody spitting at me and those, those sorts of things. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I want to move forward. But I just wanted us to just think about, you know, in some small way, we can kind of relate a little bit to Ezekiel. Um, he's he's going to just experience stubbornness. Now, by the way, let's make sure we're also pointing the finger at ourselves. We don't need to be the stubborn people who refuse to hear what God's Word says. Like it or not, we need to accept what it says. But we, we can kind of relate a little bit in, in some way to the way Ezekiel is feeling here. All right, as we move forward, this gets really fascinating. I just love this, starting in verse, verse 8. We're not going to read this whole thing, but God, uh, beginning in this verse, tells Ezekiel, he, give, he gives Ezekiel a scroll, and he tells him to eat the scroll. <laughs> now, on the screen, you're, you see a scroll. Um, this is actually the Isaiah scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So um, it would have been a scroll like this one, um, just, just the paper rolled up. And, you know, I assume just the paper. Uh, sometimes they would have wood, little things in there, but... In the vision, he's told to eat the scroll. I think that's probably just the paper. Sometimes the paper, you know, was parchment. Sometimes it was made out of animal skin. But this is not real life. Now, he's not actually eating this, but in the vision, he, he consumes it. And what's unique? What's unique about the scroll that he's told to eat? Okay, I'm going to get to that. But what else before that? Yeah, before that, what, else? what about it being written on Written on both sides. Now, that's just not what you did back then. You wrote on one side. You know, the, the, the back part was the back part, right? And you notice this on this Isaiah scroll. You don't see any words on the back part, right? They're all on the, this part. So it was written on the front and back. What do, you, what do you think the point of that is? Very important. God had a lot to say. It's very important. In fact, what was the gist of the message? Look, yeah, the, the, look at the end of the last verse of chapter 2. It says it was written, and written on it were lamentations, mournings, and woe. It's not a feel-good message. This message is not going to be fun to hear, right? This is not a positive message. So, but anyway, that's what's written. God had a lot of that lamentation, mourning, and woe kind of a message to give, written on the front and back. So he eats the scroll. Just kind of picture that, you know, in the vision. You know, just picture him just chowing down on this scroll, and he just, he just eats it. And let's kind of pause here and just think about just how powerful that image is, that, that symbolism. This is a vision. It's symbolic, but there's a point behind it. There's a, there's a truth behind this that's being communicated. So what point do you think God was trying to make with Ezekiel eating this scroll that has his word on it? Ma'am? Absolutely. It becomes internal. Jack? It, it, <clears throat> the gospel is the good news. When we preach it, when we teach it, we always teach it as the good news. And that's the honey. But yes. when it, it gets to the other person, then that's when it becomes better. Okay, yeah, and I'm going to get to that point uh, in just a minute. And I agree with that totally. But I just want to focus on just the eating of the scroll. Not the sweet part right now, just the eating of it. Um, maybe a part of it is Ezekiel has to embrace it. He has to, he's not going to like this message. It's a hard message. I don't know if this is where it came from, but it made me think of the saying, like, it's a hard truth to swallow. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is mm -hmm. a really hard thing to swallow, but he needs yes. to embrace it. Yes. Oh, that's great. I didn't even think of that. That's a great thought. Sir Mana? Yes. Yes. So many passages come to mind. I'll just put a few of them. Matthew 4. Verse 4, Jesus said, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God's word is what we are to subsist on. It is our, su it is our sustenance. It, it is our nourishment. Right? Or here's a, a verse in John 4 where Jesus said, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. Jesus had a lot of language like that. Another passage I don't have on the screen is in Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus said, Blessed are those who do what? hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be what? They shall be satisfied. Like, the idea here is his, his, his belly is to be full with eating this, this message. So there's so much that we could go into. And I also wanted to put this verse on the screen, Colossians 3, where Paul said, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. 
He's not talking about eating there, but he's talking about having God's word in us. So the goal really is we don't want God's word to just be the separate thing. And yeah, we open it once in a while. We want it to be in us. We want to consume it. We want it to become part of, you know, we want to become part of who we are. Right? Jason, real quick. Jesus was the word, right? Yes. And our example, we are to be the word. Amen. And he called himself the bread of life. I mean, I, there's so many places we could go with that. It's very rich. Practically speaking, how can you and I eat God's Word today? For dinner right now. I think it's Larry Van Cleef. Every time I preach, it seems like he's, he, afterwards he probably says the same thing to you, Brian. Uh, thank you for feeding me today. And that's always stuck with me. So we do it by doing what? Studying it, spending time in it. Uh, you know, meditating, meditating. Absolutely. Memorizing scripture. I think that's an important point about the meditating. It's not just reading the words that are there. It's thinking on them and understanding yeah. what they mean in terms of how am I going to make these words of God a part of who yeah, I am. Yeah, that's it. Amen. All right, now, before I ask this next question, I want to point out what was already pointed out by, um, by Jack. But you see in chapter 3 and verse 3, when he ate it, it was sweet as honey in his mouth. Uh, let me just take one or two guesses. Why do you think the scroll was as sweet as honey? I know Jack already pointed something out, but see if anybody has any thoughts on that. Why was it as sweet as honey? Sir? It, it is sweet, especially to those who believe, and he was, you know, he's on God's side, so it's yeah. going to be a sweetness. Yeah. Sorry to say sir to you. We're like the same age. <laughs> it's a, I do that too. It's the martial artist in me. You know, I was, yes, sir. So, yeah, it's God's Word. It's sweet. But it, what's the irony of this? The Word is a word of what kind of message? Condemnation. Yeah, this is a condemnation. This is a lamentation and woe, and yet it's still sweet. Can God's Word, even, even the hard parts to hear, can it still be sweet? Yeah. It should all be sweet. It should be something that we view as something um, beautiful and delicious because this is God's word and it has his divine purpose behind it. So that's, that's, that's a good thought. Now, I do, I do want to point something out really quickly. I wish I could go here more and spend more time, but in Revelation 10, John sees a vision of this great angel and he's got a, a scroll in his hand, it's this little book as it's called, and John is told to go and take the scroll and, uh, oh, this passage in Psalm 19.10, I forgot to point out, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. But in, in Revelation 10, so I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book, and he said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and in my mouth it was as sweet as honey, and when I would eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. Pretty obvious connection to Ezekiel 3. Like, unmistakable. But what's different about this one? This bitter. Yeah, in Ezekiel 3, it's not pointed out that his stomach was made bitter. Although I will say in verse 14 of chapter 3, it does point out, he, he says, I went embittered in the rage of my spirit. But it's different. It doesn't actually point out that the, the scroll made his stomach bitter. But that, you know, that's such a strong point. You know, we even have, we have a, uh, a little saying, if, if something is it's good but it's a little bad, what do we call it? We call it bittersweet. I almost wonder if that comes from Revelation 10. It's, the scroll was sweet but bitter. Uh, I, I can recall having a meal recently. Uh, my family and I went to eat at this Tex-Mex place that we're not really used to eating at. and Almost like fast food quality food. And we loved it. We were so hungry, we were like devouring it. And then 10 minutes later, we were all, we just were groaning. Just, oh. I mean, we've all had experiences like that where you love it at the moment, but afterwards it's, you're not enjoying the, the after effect. That's kind of how John was there. And, uh, you know, Jack made a good point about that with God's Word, right? That God's, God's Word is, it, it, is a, it is a wonderful thing, but there are consequences. And John's the one who's experiencing the consequences. So it's sweet but bitter even to John. 
How can, how can God's message be sweet but even bitter to the very one delivering it? Let's see if anybody else who hadn't answered wants to throw their hand up real quick. How can God's word be sweet and bitter to the one delivering it at the same time? Jared? That person, as they're delivering it, might come to a realization that they're not living up to it yeah. themselves. Okay, okay, that, that's a possibility. Oh. Ready? And God's word can require, it requires changes of us. And right. sometimes we're not preparing to make those changes. I've probably said it before, but the missionaries from, say, Australia have talked about how the going to the pub is a part of their life, it's just part of it. And having to give that up is hard for them. Uh -huh. Yeah, so those are, those are some great thoughts. Let me take one more, Scott. Say uh, harsh to the ears, but sweet to the soul. Okay, harsh to the ears, but sweet to the soul. Those are all great thoughts. Uh, I, I, I'll take one more, Miss B. I got to let you say something. Uh, well, what, the way it affects those you love. Okay. Yeah. It may yeah. not affect us personally. Okay. We love people who are not going to live up to that word. Good. We haven't been Good. Up to it. Good. Yeah. Th those are all great points. But again. This is John experiencing the consequences. John is feeling the, the bitterness. He's the one delivering the message. And I think, you know, a point about that that could be made is when, when we deliver God's word, there are sometimes consequences. It, it, we love it, but to deliver it, we're going to have to endure some consequences to that. Jason, you're dying. Go ahead. Uh, it's kind of the point you're trying to make is that, that, that when John's delivering this word, he's, or, or when Ezekiel's delivering this word, he's offering problems to these people you and, and so yes it's sweet to deliver the truth of the scripture but it's sad that he's delivering it to people who one may not listen to it and two are in desperate need of it yeah yeah well those are great thoughts i probably shouldn't have gone so far on so long on that because that point's not really made in ezekiel that's more in john but uh let's move forward here in verses 4 through 11 god tells ezekiel to be hard-headed <laughs> so he like tells him, I, I want you to be really, really hard-headed. And so I'm not going to read this whole thing, but a few things to point out. In verses 5 and 6, he tells him, you're going to a people that should listen to you. They speak your language. These are your people. You're not, I'm not sending you to the Babylonians, people who don't know your language, that kind of an idea. You're going to people who should respond to you. These are your people, and they're not going to listen. In John 1, you know, it says that Jesus was sent to his own, but then what does it say? His own received him not. Again, you see that Jesus-Ezekiel kind of connection in their ministry, their, their, their mission. Uh, yeah, and you know, I just have to think about sometimes it's sad when preachers, and I'm not talking about me, I'm not talking about Brian here, uh, but when, when preachers sometimes might really be trying to drive home a point, and these very people that they know God's word, they should be the very ones to receive it, are the ones that, that give them a hard time. Or you have brethren who, you know, maybe they can't, they, they can't reconcile, they can't get along, and yet these are brethren. These are the very people that, of all the people in the world, should be able to reconcile, should be able to make peace and, and, and get along. Uh, so he sent to these people that they should be the ones to receive his word, and, and they're the ones who are not, which is ironic. So many points that I kind of have to move through, but in verse, verse 8, God says, I've made your face hard, as hard as their faces, and your forehead as hard as as their foreheads. Really quick, interesting point. The word hard is the Hebrew word chazak. Ezekiel's name uh, starts with uh, a word that is basically that same word, uh, chazek, which means to harden. And the second part of Ezekiel's name is El. So God's, uh, I mean, Ezekiel's name means God hardens. So God's telling this man whose name means God, har God hardens, I want you to harden your head. Pretty obvious connection with the name of Ezekiel. But it's interesting in verse 9, he says, like emery, harder than flint, I've made your forehead. I was just joking with emery before we started. And I said, I'm going to talk about you tonight. He said, my name is not anywhere in the Bible. I said, yes, it is. It's just spelled different. But emery, uh, you may have a different rendering there, but basically on the screen, you're looking on the, on the right side, you see the emery rock. And on the left, you see the corundum. Some versions, my center column says corundum instead of emery. The, you know, emery is made up 
a lot of times uh, it, it has within it the corundum uh, basically crystal. So the, the emery rock is really hard. The corundum, you can like scratch rocks with it. Like you can cut rock with it. So that's what God is telling you. I'm going to make your, hard, your head harder than flint. You think flint is hard? Your forehead's going to be a lot harder than that. <laughs> what, what's the point? Why is he telling him, I'm going to, I'm going to make your head hard. You're going to be as, as hard-headed as these people. So much resistance He's got to be tough, right? With all that resistance. He's got to stick to his guns. Now let me ask you a question for us. How can we be hard-headed in, a, in evangelism in a good way? In what way can we be hard-headed Deanne? That's it? Don't back away from what... It's so easy if people are rejecting what we're saying and rejecting it and rejecting it and rejecting it and rejecting it. Reject it, reject it. It's so easy to adapt to what we say, to make it more palatable, to ignore the truth, uh, the hard truths, uh, to back off from you know, the pattern of God's Word and the authority of His Word and things like that. We cannot do that. In that sense, we need to be hard-headed like Ezekiel was told to be. Uh, Brian? Yeah, it's easier said than done, but just don't let rejection bother you. Yeah. Just accept it. I've, I've got to be rejected. Yeah. Just let it roll off. Yes. Yeah, in fact, one of the applications, you know, sometimes we'll say, well, we need to share the gospel, you know, no matter how people respond, even if people reject us. Well, I would take that a step further, learning from Ezekiel, we need to share the gospel with people even if we know they're going to reject us. Now, I don't think we can ever actually totally know that, but let's just say that you know 100% somehow you just know this person is not going to listen to what I have to say. What would that naturally do to our motivation? Destroy it. Why share it? I know they're not going to listen. Doesn't matter. God tells Ezekiel, hey, they're not going to listen. You can know that, but I want them to know a prophet has been among them. You see, it goes back to the main point. God is pleased when His Word is preached, whether received or never believed. I want to memorize that. I keep having to look down. I don't have it memorized yet. All right, Jason, go ahead. I'm all with you. Okay, I thought you were waiting. Well, you know, it's Jeremiah. We have prophet after prophet who God said in advance they're not going to listen to you. We have the example of the apostles. Christ telling them. Yeah, Jeremiah. They're, yeah, yeah. Christ told them, there are places you're going to go and they're not going to have anything to do with you. They don't, yep. they don't care. Over and over. But we need to keep in mind, we're not trying to please ourselves. We're not trying to please the people we're teaching. Yep. We're trying to please God by spreading His Word. Amen. So, starting in verse 12, God appoints Ezekiel as a watchman. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to get into this section. I say unfortunately because I really want to. But I'm going to wait until we get to chapter 33. I don't know if it would be Brian teaching that or me, but chapter 33 reiterates the same point here but goes into more detail and I really want to wait till then to drive this lesson home but basically he's telling him you, uh, well first of all he has transported uh, the spirit and transports him he hears the wings and the wheels of those those four living creatures and he is brought to the river Chabar uh, apparently God was speaking to him in person uh, away from the captives so he's, he's now with the captives he sits for a week they're like really confused. Why is he just sitting there? Then he begins to, then the Lord begins to tell him, I've appointed you as a watchman. The job of a watchman is to warn. And the basic idea here is that, listen, you warn, and if they listen to you or if they don't listen to you, whatever consequences come on them, that's on them. As long as you warn them, you're good. If you don't warn them, then it's going to be on your head. For, for not doing your part. Now, we're not Ezekiel, okay? We're not prophets. We're not given that direct charge. But uh, I think there is some application of that for, for us. And again, we'll get into that more in chapter 33. So, let's go right into our last section. I'm moving along pretty quickly here. So, I think we're going to have time here. Uh, well, let's read this last section, starting verse 22. The hand of the Lord was on me there, and he said to me, Get up, go out to the plain, and there I will speak to you. So I got up and went out 
to the plain. And behold, the glory of the Lord was standing there like the glory which I saw by the river Chabar, and I fell on my face. Now, we already pointed that out on Sunday. Same reaction he had at the end of chapter 1. He falls on his face in, in just awe, fear, uh, reverence of Yahweh. Verse 24, The Spirit then entered me and made me stand on my feet, and He spoke with me and said to me, Go shut yourself up in your house. As for you, son of man, they will put ropes on you and bind you with them so that you cannot go out among them. Moreover, I will make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth so that you will be mute and cannot be a man who rebukes them, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak to you, I will open your mouth and you will say to them, Thus says the Lord God, He who hears, let him hear. And he who refuses, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. This is a little difficult. First of all, well, the general idea is he's going to be restrained. He's going to be restrained from being out among them, restrained from speaking to them in, in, with the same freedom that he once had. And it'll be something that is to make a point. He's going to be kind of cooped up in his house. They're going to put ropes on him. I don't know how long that was going to last. I don't know exactly if, if they were just trying to bind him and they didn't want him out there with them uh, or if this was part of like him telling them to do this to him, to make this point. I'm not sure, but they're going to put ropes on you and I'm going to make you mute. Now, do you think that means that he wasn't able to speak at all? It, it can't be because it's not until chapter 33 that God allows him to not be mute anymore. And he had a lot of things to say between here and there. Uh, I think the idea is God would make him mute in the sense that he would not be free to just communicate God's word at will. That there would be a noticeable difference that now he was going to be kind of silent and give them a little bit of the silent treatment. And it would be, in a sense, like a bit of a rebuke. Any of y'all remember when you were kids and your dad just gave you the look? It was just the eye. He just gave you the eye. You know, he, he didn't have to say a word. He just looked at you, and without saying a word, you knew you were in trouble. <laughs> um, can y'all relate to that? You know, I, I, I know that sometimes with my kids, I can just give them a look, and especially June because she's so tenderhearted, and she'll, sometimes that's all it takes to make her break down. Just that look of disapproval um, without saying a word. And so even without, it was kind of like his silence was communicating to them, uh, you're not listening anyway, so I'm just not going to say anything right now. But whenever he did say something, God was the one communicating that message. And that was abundantly clear to the people. Because he says it over and over. In fact, this is really interesting. Phrases like, and the word of the Lord came to me, tell them thus says the Lord, declares the Lord God, those kinds of phrases are found about 300 times in the book of Ezekiel. I mean, it's just amazing how many times it is, this is the word of the Lord, 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 the word of the Lord. You think that he was trying to make a point with that? Absolutely. So that they could see and realize this wasn't Ezekiel speaking, this was God that was speaking through him. All right, And I, I want to point out one more thing before I open up for comments, and that is this. In verse 27, at the end of verse 27, we have a very familiar phrase. What is it? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Where have we heard that before? The only other time that this phrase is in the Bible is in the Gospels and in the book of Revelation. It's one time in Ezekiel. The rest of the times it's in the Gospels and it's in the book of Revelation. It is an unmistakable connection. When you hear Jesus say that, you know, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Or when in Revelation, you re he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
You need to remember that comes from the book of Ezekiel. It is, I think, point, it is powerful that in Ezekiel, they were so stubborn. And so when you hear that statement, it is a reflection of the stubbornness of the hearers. What do you think? Tell me, what do you think is the point of that statement? He who has ears, let him hear. What's the point of that? Okay. And so it is saying I'm speaking to those of you who are willing to hear. Okay. I think also that the point is, you no, know, he gave us two ears and one mouth. So okay. So he who has ears, let them listen, let them take it all in. If you've got ears, God gave you those things for a reason. You can choose to use them to listen to the Word of God, or you can choose to not. So God's not going to force anybody. There's free will, but God gave you those ears so you can listen uh, to, to the Word of God. Really, really great point. It's also, is this, if you have ears to hear, this is something you need to listen to. You know yeah. what I mean? He's yeah. identifying this is important for you to hear. I know you may hear all kinds of other stuff, but if you can hear it all, you need yeah. to hear this. Yeah, it's, it's almost, here. it kind of reminds me of, you know, when preachers... Uh, it, it kind of cracks me up when they'll say, if you're here this morning, we'd like to ask you to, you know, respond to the gospel invitation. And I always think, well, they're here listening to you. And you're saying, if you're here this morning, well, they wouldn't hear you if they weren't, if they weren't here. But, you know, in a way, it's similar. You know, Ezekiel's saying, if, if you, basically, if you, God is saying through Ezekiel, if you've got ears, you need to listen. He who's got ears, let him hear. Well, of course, everybody's got ears. And so the point is, you should be, you should be choosing to, uh, to listen. Yes, Mr. Herb. I like what he says on the end. And those who refuse the rebellious. Yeah. They're not just people who are apathetic. They're not just people who, they just don't understand. Yeah. He says they're rebellious. They're rebellious. That's their spirit. You know, I, I mentioned earlier, or I asked y'all to mention, any, share any stories of you kind of having some, you know, experiences with people who just stubbornly resisted God's Word. Uh, I had a situation like that one time. There was a, a point I was trying to make, a, a scriptural point I was trying to make, and this lady said, well, it doesn't say that in my Bible. And I was, it was at her apartment. I was door knocking, and she had her door open. I had another young man with me. And I said, well, do you mind me reading it out of your Bible? I was trying to be nice. And she said, okay. She went and got her grandfather's Bible. She said, this Bible is very special to me. She was a King James Version. She handed it to me. So I turned, and I read it to her from her own Bible and said the same thing. You know what she said next? She said, well, that's Paul saying that, not Jesus. And she closed her door. What that showed me is this is the attitude of somebody that's rebellious. It's not the attitude of somebody that is even open to the truth of God's Word. If a person doesn't want to hear God's Word, they'll find every way around it possible. They'll, they'll go on YouTube and find some video. and it'll, it'll, If you want to believe something, you'll find somebody out there, some argument to support you. Your, our attitude needs to be, what is God's Word? I don't care. What it is, I just want to know what it is, and however hard it might be, I'm going to do that. However unpopular it might be, I'm going to do that. I'm going to commit to that. And that's kind of the takeaway I just want to leave, uh, leave with you all. Mr. Roy? It's also, you know, it's, it's God doesn't want anyone to prepare. And so in that statement... Um, everyone that can hear, I hope they hear. Let them hear. Mm -hmm. I want everybody to hear, and that's what it, that's the that's the desire yes. for everybody right. that that they hear. Yeah, and that's what God wants for everybody. He can't force. He can't for, He could force them, but He allows them to have the, the free will to reject that. Good point. Okay, I'm gonna ta I'm gonna quiz y'all on Sunday. See if you can remember this. God is pleased when His Word is preached, whether received or never believed. I'm not really going to quiz you. That's okay. Um, 
Please read through page 35A uh, and through Ezekiel 7 for Sunday. Thanks, everybody.